Good afternoon. How are you doing? <laughs> Looks like I'm a little early here. We just need to find the rest of our gang and we're in good shape here. <laughs> That's right. How's, how's your day been? It's been good. I've been uh, been working on some uh, exam studying. Ah. Uh, got a lot coming up, but but it's been it's been pretty nice. Had a great St. Patty's yesterday, so. All right. All right. How about yourself? Uh, doing well, doing well. I'm 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 kind of in the northwest part of the city, so uh, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a gamey kind of a gamey situation right now. Uh, there's some risk that we could lose our power in the midst of this because of the weather. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I've heard. So uh, we've been scrambling around to see if we can find a way to to keep to keep the lecture going, <laughs> even, though, even if I lose power. Okay. I think we've got it. I think we've got it. So we'll see. Have any of you met our guest by chance uh, uh, this time, uh, Jeremy? He's he's not so many years out of our program, but he certainly has been uh, very busy in that time. So it's going to be fun to catch up with him and see what all he's done. Good afternoon, Dr. Archer. Good afternoon, Sammy. Good to see you. Same here. Professor Ling. Good evening. Good afternoon. Whatever. Uh, we have Jeremy. Uh, not yet. Philip, uh, did you get my message that uh, you're now co-host? You're muted. You're muted. So yeah, did did you get my message? Sorry, sir. Are you speaking to me? Yes. Oh, uh, did get, I did you I've... get my email of about ten minutes ago? <laughs> I will take a look right now, sir. Okay. I've given you an assignment. Are we without Mr. Uh, are we without uh, Mr. Becker today? Uh, we're, we're without Mr. Becker. He's he he uh, was compelled to move today. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, well, I was concerned about uh, the um, uh, w what could happen without him here because uh, he's the he was the co-host, and uh, if my power gets shut down by the weather, it would it would kill the lecture. So uh, so Philip, you are now the co-host. Uh, and uh, so your main duty is just don't go away till it's over. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> so if you can do that, we're in good shape. Excellent. I think I can manage that. All right. All right. So how's everybody else managing? Did, oh, did you all survive uh, St. Pat's Day? I, I guess we have a basketball game going. I forgot about it completely at this point. I guess we have a basketball game going. I, I have no idea. No, it's no probably spoilers. I'll watch it later. Excuse me? No spoilers. I'll watch it later. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Don't anybody sell because most of us, I guess, are going to watch it later. <laughs> They're a scrappy team. Sometimes they look good and sometimes they struggle. I'm, I'm confused. I thought we played tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm confused. I'm. I'm juggling too many uh, dates and preps. That's right. The the game is uh, tomorrow, uh, leading up to our uh, our uh, uh, capstone course. So by the time we get together for the capstone, uh, uh, the game will be two thirds uh, uh, through. Have you spoken to Jeremy this week? Because I mean, is he? Uh, we've communicated. Yeah. Well, he professes to be looking forward to it. Well, he is an old student, so I can I can still get on him if he's late. <laughs> I was trying to figure out which uh, what uh, what vintage he is. I, I didn't uh, I ran out of time to check it, but it's uh, somewhere in the uh, 05, 06 
range? Yeah, I would say 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. It was when we were in our old offices in Stusen, Dr. Archer. Okay. That's been quite some time. Yeah. It's amazing to think we're six weeks away from uh, the end of your tour. Two year tour. <laughs> Two years for you, yes. You. Bill, did you, has everybody lost access to CoStar? I have not checked with my teammates yet, sir. Well, you Is saw it. Yeah, the last time it worked for me, but let me quickly check, please. We're waiting for word from Sammy here. <clears throat> Has anybody uh, else uh, besides uh, Philip uh, tried to access your STDB account? in recent days. Yeah, yeah. we're just fine work. Work. Yeah. Are you able to get in okay? Yes, yeah. sir. STDB works okay. and CoStar works, yes. Okay, we'll be looking at uh, some applications of it tomorrow. It looks like it's, it's a pretty powerful tool in the context of our, uh, uh, our, our project. And I see a Jeremy Pino joining us. I have a I have a weather squawk box about uh, a foot away from our my uh, computer here. Uh, it's been pretty disruptive this afternoon, but uh, so I'll I'll. Uh, mute myself for the main part. <clears throat> a weather squawk box? What is that? Weather squawk box, a warning, weather warning box. Oh. And it's very noisy, very annoying. <clears throat> Confessed and dated myself and mentioned that I had a wind up version of one of those. <laughs> right. Actually, uh, I, I have one of those too as well. Jeremy, hello, welcome. Hey. Hey, Dr. Archer. You made it. I made it. Jeremy Pino, what, we were just trying to guess if you, your graduation year, do you, would you mind telling us? Uh, what was the guess? 2004 or five? That's close, yeah, 2003. Ah. Uh -huh. And who's the guy you hung around with a lot? Was it Chad Kiner? Was he the guy that was your? Yep, yeah, Chad actually, he works, he works for our company. He works for Walker and Dunlop. He does? In, oh, in Columbus, Ohio, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, Chad, he's, yeah, he moved back to uh, Columbus, is where he's from, Ohio State. And uh, yeah, so we, we've done some deals together, actually, co-brokers and stuff. Tell him I said hello. I remember you guys in my office one time talking about baseball and the team you were playing on. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 the um, intramural or the yeah, adult yeah. league. We're in the adult yeah. league. Yeah, it was it was good. We we had a good class. We had an interesting class. I just I was actually with uh, 
Remember Ron Carpenter? Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was with Ron yesterday. I had grabbed a couple drinks with him for St. Patty's Day. Uh, so I still keep up with him. And then Andrew Kennedy, still hang sure. out with him. And sure. and uh, yeah, so kept up with the you know five or six people I talk to all the time from the class. Great. Great. Excellent. And I feel like I met half of your class, so they will uh, they've all reached out and come down and visit as well. So. Excellent. Yeah, well, we certainly encourage them. We know it overwhelms some of the board members, but uh, I know you've, uh, had, so you've had some of our current class visit you, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, we had last last Friday. Uh, there was three of us or three of them that came, and then uh, we got a we got a good group in Tampa that kind of um, you know some board members that that support, and then I want to say maybe in September. Uh, maybe around there we had, I think there was maybe seven or eight people came down to visit. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we took them out to, took them out to lunch on a Friday. That's, that's always my offer. I can always get, I can always get the board members out on a Friday, um, <laughs> Interesting. For, for a lunch. Yeah. So it's, um, it's open to whoever, whoever wants to come down, I can always wrangle them up. Um, <laughs> uh, whatever, we, whatever weekends were free. So, um, I do, I do encourage that. Excellent, excellent. You heard that, gang? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I was just, I was just, uh, just had a call with Brett uh, Galissimo, I think. I think he was in the, he just, he just left his company and I told him that I was doing the Ring Speaker Series and that oh. that was supposed to be for people that are old. So I'm not sure what's <laughs> yeah. going on. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Brett well, Calcino. Once in a while we yep. once in a while we let a whippersnapper in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what does that say about Archer and, and I? If we're um, if we have uh, you know, uh, uh, you're a, you know, a prominent board member. Well, and then Ar Archer, he taught my first boss, Al Rex. So I'm I, I'm not making any judgments anywhere. So. <laughs> well, I think Archer's hosting this, so. We have, a, we have a good group, so uh, let's uh, let's get you launched, uh, Jeremy. Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll say a word, but maybe you know this guy already. Uh, we, we just established that he was a graduate MSRE in 2003 and uh, has had, uh, in that time, he's had uh, well over a decade of experience in commercial property finance at a high level. And uh, it's a world that is important to all of us and of interest. And so we're delighted to hear his war stories or his experience there. And uh, meanwhile, he's also been among our most positive and uh, active alumni in many respects, and has had a bit, big part of a, of a very impressive group down in the Tampa Bay area that is constantly reaching out to uh, the world at large and to our students. So we're grateful for them and grateful for Jeremy's part of it. Jeremy, welcome. Uh, tell us your story. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I do, I do encourage. I think some of them might actually have uh, scholarships from um, called the Society of Real Estate Professionals, which is uh, uh, the the group in Tampa that we we formed. We used to be the Bertram Council, and and uh, yeah, so happy to happy to kind of give back and and uh, and then and then share and mentor, you know, for everyone that that reaches out. So sometimes I don't get to them till a uh, month later, but you know, happy to do it and. Um, I will say just before, I just don't remember our class being as sharp as the people that reach out. So not sure what that means, but, or maybe I just, it wasn't as, as focused as, as some of the, some of the people that are, that are reaching out to me. So, um, but I do have some slides that I can kind of see if I can, unless you're allowing me to share the screen, right? I can share. Yes. Yes. Okay. I might just add uh, that, uh, Jeremy is with Walker and Dunlop, and if you're not already acquainted with them, you'll want to be. They're a, they're a very respected uh, brokerage and uh, and uh, uh, investment firm in the industry. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And can you all see that? Is that, that yes. come up? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, I think I'll just go in. I'll go in kind of you know my story, and then um, go a little bit into kind of Walker Dunlop, which I think I think we've hired. Um, you know, besides myself and Chad Kiner on the production side, I think we've hired maybe an analyst a year for the past couple of years. Um, I think Jason Banky, I think he, he just signed on for our, um, 
uh, Atlanta office for the underwriting side. So, um, but uh, y'all get into it. So, um, Jeremy Pino, uh, graduate of uh, MSRE 2003. Um, I, you know, I was one of the, at that time, they didn't have a lot of people that went straight from undergrad to, uh, to the graduate side of it. Um, they didn't have the dual, the dual track program or the, the two-year program that was there. And so I came fresh out at 23 and, and uh, got hired to do exactly what I'm doing now, which is um, I originate, for the most part, um, debt for commercial real estate, um, all property types, uh, retail, commercial, or retail office, self-storage, hotels, uh, industrial, and multifamily. Um, recently, as uh, uh, you know, I've been doing more multifamily, and I'll, I'll kind of yeah. get into why why that is, you know, a potential path if you kind of go down this route. Um, so the company we were at um, was originally called Collateral. It was hired by Al Rex, who's a, who's a board member that was here, uh, moved, moved to South Florida with him. Um, you know, during from 2003 to like 2006, a lot of those smaller um, mortgage broker shops, I guess you would call them, got acquired into, into larger companies. Uh, our company got acquired into a company called Grandbridge um, Real Estate, which was owned by bb and I moved to Tampa in 2008 um, when, I was, when I was 27 to go into a production role um, up there. And I was, I was with Grandbridge doing what I do now, same thing uh, from 2008 until 2014. In 2014, I left to go to um, a competitor, or well, I guess a competitor at the time, Walker and Dunlop, who was really growing their their capital market side of the business, which is which is someone that does all all property types. Um, when I joined Walker and Dunlop, they they had just gone public in 2011 um, during the recession, and they were they were looking to grow their company with some pretty ambitious goals um, of how are they going to grow it. Uh, I joined the stock price. It was a, it was a public company. It was 14 bucks, and they had 400 employees. Uh, today, the stock price is well over 100, and uh, well over 1,100 employees. And I'll kind of kind of break down how that how that works, you know, from you know from 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 that side. Um, member of uh, SoRep, which I'm member of, uh, UF Advisory Board member, um, and uh, yeah, love 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 to kind of get back. So. That's kind of that's kind of my story. Um, today, I would say I specialize in multifamily construction, which I have a, a case study which I'll kind of go over of a of a project we did in Lakeland um, with a group that I think hires there as well called Framework Framework Group, which is a, a public partner, partnership um, development in in downtown Lakeland to, to revitalize it. So I'll kind of I'll kind of go through that. Um, so before I start, I mean just kind of what I tell everyone that reaches out to me, this is kind of, you know, some, some of the, what I have found is, as I've gone in my career is that, you know, the best advice I, I say to students is that when you're coming out of the program, it's good to reach out to me and other advisory board members and get their perspective. But, you know, soon when, when you're ready to kind of transition from an analyst to production and, and making decisions, you know, I'm going to be, you know, already have my established relationship or maybe I'm retired. I mean, who knows, but my best advice is to always look at the five classes before you and the five classes after you. Um, Cause those are the people that are going to grow as you grow in your career, they're going to grow in your career. And then they're all going to you know, become decision makers today. I mean, I can't tell you how, how true that is today. I would say of, of the clients that I have, I would say 30, 40% of them have some tie to the MSRE program and, 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 or, you know, plus or minus five, five classes with me. So, um, you know, come back when they invite you back. Um, I know when they will have more in-person stuff, they always have a, an event where they allow you to, to come back and, and mentor. So I would always take the opportunity to, to do that and drive up to Gainesville and, and meet them and, um, and to come back. So uh, before I start, the second, the second question I know a lot of people always ask is, you know, with COVID and kind of, I know you guys are, uh, I think just starting in, in-person classes um, of whether we're back in the office and, and um, we are, you know, we've been back in the office since June. Um, so almost, almost a full year uh, to kind of get back there. Um, and just as kind of a, a global of where, where our company is headed um, and whether, 
uh, it's almost a real estate question of, of whether office will die or whether people are going to go back to the office. Um, I know our CEO is very intent on not allowing people to work from home unless they get a waiver. So um, even, even with COVID, I think, I think some companies, the world will change, but um, you know, uh, kind of where we're at, they, they believe kind of the, you know, the personal relationships, the personal relationships matter. So, and I, I think the same, I was happy to, to kind of get back in the office. So I know that's a lot of questions that people have and, and we'll have the time for Q and A afterwards. So figure I'll just go through, um, I'll give an overview of Walker and Dunlop. Um, with the overview, I'll break down kind of what we do. Um, the slides are also good because they show what property types we do, what percentage we do, who the capital sources are, and hopefully give you a, a pretty good sense of kind of, you know, how the financing world is is working today from our side. Um, I'll give you some brief, you know, transaction highlights of um, what Walker and Dunlop's done, some big deals, um, none of which I did, um, but I'll kind of show you kind of on a, on a grand scale you know, how, how it helps function the world. And then I'll give you a case study on the apartment development we did in, in, uh, in downtown Lecklin. And, and then at the end, happy to take any questions and question and answer uh, phase for you guys. Um, so Walker and Dunlop, um, you know, it's, it's uh, like I said, it's a, a, I think 1,100 employees today. Um, you know, culturally for me, why I left Scrambridge, you know, I first left because it had a better platform. Um, they were always good multifamily lenders. It was something that I was, I was doing a lot of, and so that was that was a major reason. But I think their, their their growth and kind of where they've they've gone is, you know, it's it's really a a culture thing. I mean, they're it's a it's a pretty young company. Um, the CEO uh, is Willie Walker, and he's you know pretty dynamic. I'm not sure if anybody has ever um, he has a every Wednesday he has a webcast um, that he does a podcast. Um, it started off during COVID of him just interviewing, you know, the top uh, real estate developers or people that were within real estate. And then he also goes into interviews. Last week, he had um, the guy who runs the aging uh, laboratory at MIT um, that goes in there and talks about the aging demographics. He has Peter Lenneman on every quarter to go talk about, you know, what's happening in the world. But I, I definitely do suggest, I think it's it's Wednesday at uh, 1230 and, and it's uh, and Willie Walker. And so this is, this is Willie, but he, he's, he really created, created this culture. Um, you know, I would say he's, uh, you know, Har Harvard, uh, but you know, he, uh, unlike the, some other CEOs that you'll see in real estate um, that'll focus on the numbers and kind of the, you get in the nitty gritty on debt service coverage ratios or, you know, try and get in into the business that we do. He is more of a, um, he looks at the global picture of how do you grow and how do you provide, how do you give the people that are producing um, the tools to, to be successful. So, um, you know, that's kind of where he, he spends his capital. Um, very technology-based and they're heading to technology-based, you know, because obviously Willie Walker, I mean, Walker and Dunlop is, is his father started the company, but you know, he went off and, and um, did, you know, some private equity stuff uh, for the for the airlines. And, and so he took a he took a, a roundabout route back into Walker and Dunlop. And, and so his, you know, when he goes in, he looks at it from a, a little bit different perspective. Um, an example of, you know, the, the, the technology that he's using is they bought a company called Enodo, which, um, you know, usually when you would get financial statements in, you would take them. You would give it to an analyst. The analyst would insert them into the underwriting, and then that analyst would spend half a day putting that in there, and you know would try and analyze it. And then they would try and go and find uh, comparable properties, um, comparable expenses, and would take you know would take a day or two to do. Um, so he he they, they invested in the company, um, and and then they ultimately bought it. But it basically takes whatever they give you, whether it's in PDF and Excel. And it automatically transports it into instantly um, into you know their system into the Excel system so into the underwriting system, and then with that it when you type in the address, we service 120 billion dollars worth of real estate. It's a pretty good chance that we service something next to where that property was. They'll then insert in their portfolio what the comparables look like, and then so they can notice any any kind of differences and 
and the expenses and the rents and anything that looks out of whack and then so they can adjust it. So um, the goal is to just, you know, you know, that's, that's where he thinks it's heading um, and, you know, kind of, kind of where he's pushed. And then, you know, just from a culture standpoint, they, they pay bonuses, they give stock prices, they give back. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a great company. I would, I would definitely look, look, um, you know, to kind of, to kind of look into the, into the company. Um, so here's some of the stuff I talked about. Um, Jeremy, can I interrupt you a second? Yeah. You mentioned yeah. His, uh, Walker's, uh, uh, is it weekly podcasts? Uh, yeah. If, if a person wants to find out sort of the views on the industry and what's happening, that's probably at the top of the list if you go to go to. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really good. I and mean, it's not just, I mean, like he's, he's had the, you know, Barry Stern, like from Starwood on, which deals directly with real estate, but a lot of them, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, you know, the behavior of people or I'll have, uh, you know, one of the top per scientists for COVID on or, or the economics, but it's, there's a lot of people that go in there and, and just listen to it every day. And it gives you a perspective. It doesn't always tie to, tie to real estate, but, um, and he's, he's excellent at it. He's, he's an excellent interviewer and, and, um, and he keeps it to an hour, which I think, I, you know, like that's kind of his thing. Like once, once that hour hits, it's, it's over. Um, and so they, they created that into a podcast, but, um, so Walker Dunlop, um, you know, obviously best places to work. I mean, I think that's been like 10 years in a row um, of where to go. Uh, obviously number 42 fastest growing publicly traded companies. And that's, that's everything. That's not just real estate companies. I think real estate wise, we're probably maybe the fastest. Um, and then kind of see kind of Fortune Magazine, all the awards that go in there. Uh, a little bit of history of the company. Um, you know, they started as a Fannie Mae lender. Fannie Mae is a, they're one of the first, you know, Fannie Mae FHA lenders doing single family homes. Um, and, you know, had the license when it, when it first came out. And, and, you know, for the most part, they were just kind of a boutique, you know, Fannie Mae lender. Uh, Willie Walker came in in 2000 and and nine in 2008, or actually 2005, but then the recession hit, and they knew that they either had to grow, be bought, or die. So they uh, they acquired a couple firms that would give them licenses to do Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which which I'll go into. Those are the two major agencies, and then ultimately took it public. And you know it was really out of um, I mean COVID. COVID's bad, but the, the recession of 2008 was, was just absolutely brutal for the financial industry. And so, um, so he grew it and then um, acquired companies like uh, um, in 2014, really started ramping up the, the other side of it. Um, and then they bought a, a multifamily sales arm um, called Ingla Financial, which now sells, sells apartments. And then, um, then also started a bridge fund um, that, corresponds with multifamily. So they're, they're highly driven on multifamily. I would say 80% of the business is multifamily, which I'll, I'll show in there. And there's a reason for that. One, it's, um, it's, it's the largest of all of the uh, industries. Um, you know, there's, uh, I, I call it math. I mean, there's a million households that get formed per year in the U.S. And, you know, that's either, um, there's someone has to live somewhere, you know, there's, there's a million, million, million apartments or a million single family homes that have to be built. And so um, as the recession hit and the housing market blew up, um, you know, the, the single family home market has not recovered to where it's at. And so naturally the mass says that multifamily has to make up. So uh, multifamily, uh, there'll be new construction of multifamily of about 300 and, 50,000 units this year, I believe. Um, and that, that'll probably be the annual average. Um, and then there's also transactions. So because, because the, um, the government sponsored entities, which are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and HUD are supposed to lend no matter what, and they're supposed to provide the liquidity to the market is the most liquid asset. And so it's the, it's the most traded asset that, that goes in there as well. And um, I'll kind of go through kind of where our, our company has gone to. Um, so this is, this is uh, what I was talking about before from the size of our company, um, our servicing portfolio, uh, how many employees we have, um, how many transactions we did, and then how many offices we have. So really covering the smile states, I, I would say, and then, you know, up in Chicago and, and Columbus and New York. And so kind of um, hitting, hitting the major metros uh, that go in there. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about the thousand employees. So from a from a business from a business side, the production, which is what I do. So I I originate loans for a client. So um, you know, a client will come to me and say, I want to buy an apartment complex. I then match them with the best capital source. That's my job. And so if it's an apartment complex, I'll go to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. I'll look at a life insurance company. I'll look at a bank. And that's my job is to bring that loan in, originate it, and then we get paid a fee on that origination. Um, with that is there's probably on the production side, 250 employees. So that's all production people plus their analysts and then maybe whoever admin is, is there. Um, the rest of the company, the rest of the 750, is either management, which is management probably maybe takes 50 to 100. And so the other 650 are there kind of helping, helping us as in the production side, uh, one, underwrite loans. So um, when you do a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, loan, you have to be a certified underwriter to go in there. Um, and so all the, all, the, all the billions of dollars that we do go into our underwriting team. They underwrite it. Um, it's, a great, it's a great job to look for if you're looking for a job in Walker and Dunlop to really, you know, see a ton of transactions. Um, you know, that is, that is definitely a place to go because you'll just, you'll see deals. You'll see how different people underwrite uh, from that standpoint. And from the underwriting team, there's probably, you know, 150. And then the rest service our loans. So we have a servicing portfolio. So when you, when we, when we originate a loan, we get the servicing rights to that loan and, and we get paid to um, not much, but just, just enough uh, profitability um, to service a loan. It, it, it serves us in, in two different ways. One, um, once we originate the loan, while we're not talking to them every day, they're talking to somebody at Walker and Dunlop every day. They're, they're collecting the payments. Um, they are, if they need to do repairs, we're holding escrows for the repairs. We're distributing the repairs out to them. If they have a special need that has, has to go within the loan, they'll, they'll call us. And so we have touch points with them every day um, to go in there. And then it is, it is a, um, it's a profit center. It's not like production where we get, you know, we get big fees for originating the loans and bringing them in. Um, but when recessions do hit, it is a, it is a solid source of income that kind of, you know, helps to keep paying the staff when the production side isn't, isn't as high. So um, the servicing side is, is something you, you can look to go into. I'm not sure if a lot of people from, from the program will go there, but you're, you're analyzing insurance, um, you're collecting payments, you're, you're dealing with, you know, kind of the day-to-day -day aspects of it. But that's, that's a large portion of our company that we're, we're constantly hiring. Um, and then we have uh, the other side is uh, our investment sales team, which sells multifamily. And then uh, we have a structured arm group, which all that means is that, um, you know, when Walker and Dunlop gets enough cash, they want to, they want to invest that cash and not, you know, sometimes they can't invest it all back in the company um, or they don't want to distribute dividends. And so another way to control business is to, um, do kind of a bridge loan product. So if, if the product's not ready to be financed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is the majority of what we do, we'll provide the bridge loan. And then it, that bridge loan is, is priced, you know, as good as anybody in the market, hopefully. And then once that's ready to be refinanced or sold, you know, there's a exit fee if they don't use Walker and Dunlop. So it's a way for us to kind of feed what we're doing um, in the industry. Um, so I'll go through the different kind of capital that we look at every day when a, when a, when a project comes in. Um, like I said, probably 70% of what we do is multifamily. So a lot of these are, are tied to multifamily, but I'll, I'll, I'll point out where, where they're at. So uh, the two agencies are Freddie Mac, or the three agencies, Freddie Mac, um, HUD, FHA, and Fannie Mae. So those, those three are all... Um, either the government sponsored entities, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which means that, that they are providing the guarantee, that basically the, the top loss piece guarantee to um, the investor that invests in those loans. So the way it works is if, a, if someone's buying an apartment complex, a 300 unit apartment complex, they come to me, we originate the loan for, through Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, 
Um, we get it approved through Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae. We close on the loan on what's called a warehouse line. So Walker and Dunlap has about a, a billion dollar warehouse line um, with the banks. We'll close on the loan and then we will sell the loan to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae um, in around 30 to 45 days. So it's on our books for 30, 45 days. They lock the rates, they lock the treasury, we sell it to them. They then take it, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, and they sell that to the market. So they'll sell that to, could be a life insurance company, could be a financial firm, could be a bank, could be a hedge fund. And they all take different pieces of that loan and, and it's called a securities, securities deal. Um, it's very similar to CMBS, um, probably what you've heard, commercial mortgage-backed security. With the only difference that one, they only do multifamily, which is by far the most favored asset class. And two, they have the backing of the federal government. So the investor that buys that knows that from a loss, from a loss perspective, it's, it's, it's almost as good as a, as a bond. Um, it does have a spread over the bond. So they want some type of return and there's, you know, it can go bad and it could get low enough to where they would have a loss piece. But for the most part, um, especially the people that are buying the most conservative tranche of that, um, it's, it's guaranteed by the government. So it, it prices, it sells really well. And they're really, they were, they were chartered and formed to provide liquidity to the market. So, um, and, I'll, and I'll go in of kind of, kind of why that would be. So the other ones you would have is bank, life insurance company, um, structured finance, um, and bridge. But the, let's, let's go to life and company, bank, and structured. So structured finance would be CMBS loans. Um, they do the same thing as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They'll do all asset types. Uh, they're not backed by the the federal government, so they're they're just they they do the same thing. They package it up, they sell it to the market, um, but you know they're trying to price it to where they can make a profit. So that's the structured finance side. Uh, the life insurance company and the bank side. The life insurance companies uh, typically do long long term loans. Um, they're matching. If you think about you know life insurance company is their they're expecting someone to live for when they when they sign up for life insurance to live for you know 20 30 40 years so they don't expect to have a payout for that time period so they uh, you know their their actuary is basically figuring out what the average life cycle is and of that and so you know they invest in they invest in bonds they invest in stocks but about 10% of what they invest all of the premiums that come in are into into real estate and they usually do it in the form of real estate loans um, and so that's that's a portion that that will compete with Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae, and then uh, the banks. The banks are mostly uh, shorter term because uh, you can pull the money in and out. And so they're typically doing construction loans. They'll do some longer term loans, um, but they'll do it through a financial instrument called called a swap. And so to circle back to why Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are there, is that it's it's really there for if you think about the apartments built in the 70s and 60s and, and you know, need some repairs or, or, or built in areas that are affordable or workforce. You know, a lot of times the life insurance companies and the banks, because they are holding everything on their books, um, will just want the best assets. They want the class A brand new property that's out there or the class B. And so if, if, if the government, if they didn't sponsor this and sell it, um, and provide this liquidity, then those projects may not get the necessary capital they need to, you know, to, to be bought and sold. And then in particular, do repairs, make sure everything is up to standards. And so, you know, they're always going to be kind of, they're kind of creating the liquidity. Um, you know, they, they used to hold a lot of it on their books, similar to a life insurance company and bank, which um, that's what part, partly what happened during the last recession is that instead of, securitizing, which I talked before, where they were, they would package it up and then sell it to the market. They were holding a good portion on their books. And so when everything kind of went bad, um, they took huge losses. So today, from the taxpayer standpoint of, of what they represent, um, they're highly successful. Um, their default rate is, is really low. And then what they are packaging off is, you know, most of the risk that is on books. So they're they're really just um, their only risk is their guarantee of the, of those loans. So, um, 
Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae will do um, next year. They'll do about 200 billion um, in transactions uh, next year, and then HUD will probably do another, you know, 20 billion. So between the between all of them, they'll do you know 280 billion um, um, that goes in there. So, so those are the kind of sources. I talked about investment sales. Um, and then we also originate bridge loans, which I kind of talked about before. Uh, a bridge loan, which I'm sure you guys have probably studied in class, is, um, is a loan is usually a value add loan. So if you buy a property and then you want to improve it, you want to do improvements to it. So you want to maximize the value before you lock into a long term loan or you want to sell it. You'll do a bridge loan. The bridge loans are meant to be shorter term. They're meant to, um, to add value. So you're you're going to get the rent increase and, you know, you know, on that. So th that's what I do all day. I, I look at all these, all of these sources and then try and figure out which one goes in, into the best. Um, thankfully I have a business partner that does a lot of the permanent stuff and the bridge loan stuff. Um, and I focus most, mostly on development, which will be, will be part of my case study. Um, so this kind of shows you, this is what Walker and Dunlop did last year uh, by capital sources. Um, so you can see multifamily was 61% of our 61% of our business. Um, again, I mean, it's, you know, if you're going into an industry, I mean, multifamily is one that um, is a good one to go into just because you'll have transaction volumes. Um, it is highly competitive because of all the transactions that go in there uh, typically has the lowest cap rates. Um, and then a lot of this is driven because of Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac provide that liquidity. Um, and then this is just by our offices. Uh, it'll be different for different offices, but I think a lot will look like this. Office is 3% retail, 2% um, and multi-property healthcare, industrial, and then other would just be, you know, I'm not sure what that, probably hotels and anything else that gets wrapped in there. Um, this used to, I would say, you know, 10 years ago, retail was a lot more, would have been a lot higher percentage um, but that's obviously slowed down and industrial has picked up, um, even though we only do 2% industrial, that's probably because we don't have as many industrial specialists, but I would say industrial has definitely overtaken retail as far as, um, you know, uh, what property types of people are buying. Um, and that's obviously the Amazon effect and, and um, you know, the distribution effect and that, you know, retail has now become, you know, a, you know, you're either at the best location or you're just not doing retail at all for the most part. Um, and then I talked about office where I thought that would, that would go. I think um, a lot of people are predicting the doom of office, but um, you know, from what I, what I've seen and, and people getting back to work, I, I think office will always be, will always have a place. I just, I'm not sure if the, there'll be as much development that goes on, but I think the existing stuff will, will go in there. Um, so that was our transaction volume. And feel free to ask any questions if you want at any time. Um, this is uh, this is just just our capital markets team. So this shows you kind of other than Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, how we finance all of these sources: the banks, CNBS, which I talked about, life insurance company, other. Again, even on the capital market side, which doesn't do any doesn't do strictly multifamily. You know, they're still doing the majority of their business multifamily, um, which is which is which is what I do. Um, and then this, you can just see from, I actually started in 2014, so you can kind of see where the company has, has grown. Um, this year was a, a big deal for us, which, which isn't on this slide, but we, we were the number one Fannie Mae lender, the number four Freddie Mac lender. Um, you can see it from, an, from investment sales, from selling it, we, we got up to number three, number five in HUD, but, uh, the ranking just came out. We were the number one multifamily lender in the country last year. So. That was a, you know, that was a goal. Like I said, uh, Willie's, Willie's goal was to have that in two, 2025. So he hit it uh, four years early, um, but um, that's been a big deal. And then you can kind of see from 2019 to, to 2020 when COVID hit and, you know, while other industries um, suffered a lot, um, you know, Walker and Dunlop had their best year ever. I mean, it wasn't even close. Um, it had had two two things that kind of you know helped spur that. One was when you have when you when you have an, we're eighty percent multifamily, so that helped our our sales is multifamily, a lot of our servicing portfolio is multifamily, and our bridge fund is multifamily. So from a 
and and the the thing that held and people paid all their rents was multifamily. So we we in April, March and April, we were a little scared to see who would pay rent, who wouldn't pay rent. Are we gonna have to come up with capital to help, you know, if people aren't making payments and there's losses, you know, we're supposed to front that. Um, but as soon as that didn't happen, um, it was it was full go. And then so the the perfect storm that happened was when you have a multifamily project. There's two things that you do with it. One, you hold it or, or you're making a capital transaction. You're either going to refinance it or you're going to sell it. And so that will probably go 50-50 depending on where the cap rates are in the year would go. Well, when COVID hit, the rates dropped, you know, the treasury dropped as low as to, to you know, to 0.2 to 20 basis points. Uh, it had never dropped below 120 before. So we, you know, we locked a deal below 2%, which is, you know, that's the first time we've ever done that in the history of our company. Um, a year before that, rates were probably in the 4% range. So every deal kind of worked. Um, and the other one was is that the investment sales side, you know, because of the uncertainty, even though people were paying rent, you know, and it was kind of, okay, it looks like we're starting to get back to normal. Everyone was still leery because they didn't know, you know, if you think back in, and March, April, May, even June into July, you still don't know when we were going to get a vaccine, how long this was going to take, is there going to be a further recession? And so anybody that was selling their property at that time was going to sell it for a discount. And so instead of selling, they decided to refinance at cheap rates and pull out cash. So we had this tremendous volume come in of, of refinancing properties. Um, I did one in Miami where you know, they were under contract to sell the seller, you know, the seller bailed, they were going to make, you know, $13 million from the sale. We ended up refinancing with a hub bone and they pulled out $10 million on refinance. So, you know, and then they got historically low rates and they're going to hold it long term. So that, that, that helps kind of push our, push our companies. And then the other one, because, you know, a lot of our competitors, they had bridge funds that, that did other asset types they're, you know, they didn't service as much as us to kind of hold on, you know, they suffered, they weren't as aggressive. They were, they were playing more defense and we were playing more offense. And so we, we stole a ton of uh, business from, from our competitors. Um, and then, you know, Willie Walker and his webcast, who knows how much that generated, he would tell you it generated a lot of it, but um, you know, that, that ultimately helped as well. So um, it's very interesting. It's, it's, and, I, and I've talked to a lot of people, um, in different industries and, you know, in real estate in Florida, um, other than maybe the retail guys and even they did okay. Um, you know, it seems like everyone has come up, you know, pretty, pretty good from COVID. I mean, it's actually a lot of, a lot of companies are saying their best years. Um, obviously the hotel guys got, got hit the hardest. So if you're in that industry, you, you were pretty bad, but, um, the other thing, just to just to go on, I'll go on a tangent on, on Florida of kind of what we're seeing, what everyone else is seeing is um, the amount of people that are moving to Florida, moving to Tampa, Miami, Orlando. Um, I know that the census numbers are going to come out in in the next couple of months, and I think I think they're going to undershoot how many people actually move to Florida. Um, I was at a meeting with uh, Wood Partners the other day. And they, you know, they own properties all through Florida, the Panhandle, Jacksonville, Orlando, and they see all the traffic that's coming in for their apartments. Their guess is that they think it's 3,000 people a day in the Florida, which would be a million. Um, I think historically Florida has probably averaged about 1,500. So they're, they're thinking double. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see, but for those that are coming out and, you know, you're going to get a job into Florida. I mean, it's, I think it's, you're going to see a lot of people that are going to be hiring, I believe. Um, you know, so just people that haven't gotten a job, just just keep after it. You know, because the the surge is the surge is the surge is definitely coming. But that's a it's a side tangent on kind of what happened with COVID. So just to give you a sense of kind of who you know, these are the bigger companies that we'll deal with. I'm sure you guys have probably interviewed with some of these, but you know, anywhere between. Um, you know, uh, Cheyenne is a uh, student housing firm. Obviously, Graystar is one of the largest owners of real estate of uh, multifamily. Uh, so is True America. Um, and so these are all, um, you know, this is our borrowers. So this is who we try and service every day and, and um, you know, our, our touch points um, of all time. 
Um, so I'll give you some transactions that we did. I didn't do these, but our, our company did it. Um, so the first one is uh, we, uh, there's, a, there's a company called Monogram um, that was a uh, public uh, real estate trust that wanted to go private. Uh, Graystar bought their, um, you know, helped take a private. So in order to do that, they had to roll them into a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan because they were they were obviously a public company using using public funds. Um, so we did that. I think in 2017, um, huge huge. It was it was the biggest deal at that time. Um, 9,000 units, 36 properties, 10 states. I mean, you can imagine how many underwriters. Again, if 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 you were to go into Walker and Dunlop and be a, an underwriter and you're underwriting these deals. I mean, you're looking at 9,000 units, you know, at one time and, and kind of putting that together. Um, some other ones um, did a student housing credit facility, um, similar. These are all, you know, uh, that was a Fannie Mae. Um, again, did a facility um, of, of green uh, apartments. All green means is obviously it's got some type of um, energy efficient appliances, low flow toilets. Um, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie, Freddie Mac are really kind of, you know, pushing towards that and trying to incentivize you to do that. Um, they're also incentivizing to do um, more affordable and workforce housing, um, which which has been a big push. Um, you know, a, affordable has always been uh, affordable has a has an actual uh, range of a, or a term. Uh, affordable is by definition is someone that makes. 60% of the average median income in that area is considered to be an affordable tenant. And so that has always been there. Um, and they've always kind of tried to lend to those properties to help uh, provide liquidity. What has changed is that it's sometimes hard to make your rents work if you have to limit your rents to 60%. And so they've raised it a little bit to what they call workforce housing. Um, which is 80% of median income. And then now you're seeing some 100% of median income that goes in there. Um, so that is, that's definitely a big push of where, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going. And, and their kind of control of, of how they lend is by, uh, they have a regulator. So the regulator gives them how much they can lend every year. Um, and their goal this year is that they have to do 60% of their business has to be at rents of 80% AMI or below. And so they're, that's the way they kind of push and pull them to kind of, to kind of get there. Um, and then they also want them to transition and, you know, to incentivize um, owners to go green um, and not just buy those properties. And so it's called green rewards. So what, are, what does both of those mean and how does Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac then push that so that everyone does that is that they'll do that in, in pricing. So if, if today a rate for uh, just a complete market rate deal that has no workforce housing or affordability and it's not green, that'll maybe get priced at 390 today. If it has green, they'll give them 20 basis points off of that. So it's 370. If it's green and it has some affordability of call it 80% of the median income, they'll give them another 20. So now you're at 350. And if your entire project is at 60% of AMI and you're green, it's another 20. So now you're at 330. So, you know, they're the regulators pushing onto them that they want them. This is where they want them to provide the liquidity. They're then pushing that back on because they got to meet those goals. If they don't meet those goals, then the next year they're subject to, you know, getting their, um, you know, their allocation cut every year. So it's, it is it is working, um, and you know it, it it seems to be a portion. You know, I mean, you'll you'll hear a lot of of wanting to take Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, out of conservatorship, which it is now in in Congress. It usually never goes anywhere, just because of the very reason that you know it seems to be to be working working today. Um, the last one, this one is um, a portfolio that we we actually did. Um, of uh, three life insurance companies, they were all crossed into into a facility, um, and uh, a company acquired them and, and did in there. So this is kind of transactions that um, standard transactions will do every day. Um, I'll I'll transition into kind of what I have been specializing in, which is um, uh, uh, new construction. Um, so the property is um, called uh, it's called Mirrorton Apartments. It's it's under construction now. Um, in downtown Lakeland, you can go to um, 
Miraton, I think it's Miraton.com, M-I-R-R-O-R-T-O-N.com and kind of look at their website. Um, but this was a, uh, a project that was um, the city of Lakeland had bought. Uh, it, it's what we're seeing a lot in, in apartment development today, um, especially among the cities and kind of where um, HUD wants to go. So HUD is the only of the agencies that does the new construction is everyone's trying to build out what they call the urban core or the, you know, of, of their area. But it's, you know, Tampa, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, they have an urban core already. Uh, these smaller cities are trying to grow into and trying to, to create energy into their cities and have walkability and create all the events. And so you, you're seeing a lot of that, a lot of that go on. And a lot of those um, in those areas, it's been sleepy for so long that either the city owns them or, you know, they have some type of blight to them. And so in order to, to incentivize developers to come in and do it, because oftentimes they are pioneering. So they're the first one in building, you know, a class A apartment complex. And sometimes the rents don't work. The city will give them certain incentives. So the city bought, I'll go into it. That's what it looks like today. So, um, you know, Lakeland obviously is, has done well um, in between Tampa and, and Orlando. Um, you're seeing a ton of industrial go on there. Um, you know, it's Publix's headquarters there. Um, Amazon just recently uh, switched where they uh, land their planes and deliver from Tampa to Lakeland because it was more central. So geographically, it's got, you know, obviously a, a great market that fundamentally you would look at. Um, so as you can see over here, but the city of Lakeland, they own, they, they bought this whole section right here in 2003 to start their redevelopment or 2004, maybe. So this was 80 different homes that were on there. So they, they purchased all 80 homes either by um, arms like transaction or eminent domain, and they cleared those out. So they did an RFP in 2007 with a developer who was going to do new townhomes, have some type of affordability to it. Obviously, the recession hit, nothing could be done with it. So they were sitting there on uh, property that they purchased with bonds and kind of paused. And so in 2015, I believe, they went out with another RFP, um, which, oh, sorry, an RFP is a request for proposals. So it's a public record request that anybody can then, you know, put their, you know, put their hat in the ring to try and, you know, win it basically and have the city of Lakeland uh, pick you. Um, and so with that RFP or you would then propose what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You would put your resume in there. Um, how much of, you know, are you going to do any type of affordability? Um, what's your, what's your look going to look like? Um, and then what do you need? What type of incentives do you need to make this work? Um, a group called Framework Group, which is based out of Tampa, that has developed over, I don't know, 20,000 20, apartment complexes. One of one of our really good clients, um, they won the RFP, um, and so kind of show you what that what that looked like. So this is Meritan. Um, so 13 acres. Um, this is what they ultimately ended up developing. So what what Lakeland wanted was. As you can see, there's no gate that's here. There's nothing else. There's street parking that's here. They wanted the walkability. They wanted the feel of a, of a walkable environment. Um, they have a big pool, the big amenities, kind of looks over the lakes. Um, so, so, and, and then this is, has walkability to, 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 to downtown. Um, so the city of Lakeland, what, what they wanted was they wanted some type of affordability. There wasn't much in there because it didn't work, but uh, five percent of the units had to be affordable and i'll kind of go into um so okay so the city of lakeland owned it so they 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 entered into a development agreement that was negotiated which is called a public private partnership you'll sometimes see that it's called a ppp um so the city of lakeland sold the 13 acres to framework framework group um, those sales proceeds then went to help pay down their bond help fund the rest of the stuff in the city so they kind of got that off their books um, the city of Lakeland then got, you know, to drive, um, activity. And then ultimately it's sitting there with no real estate taxes on there. And then, you know, after the, the tip, which I'll go into, um, is gone, then they'll have, you know, six, $700,000 a year in taxes. 
So that's constant revenue that the city has has gone. And then in what they hope happens is in not only that apartment complex happens and another one happens next to it without incentives and then that drives rents and and um, they continue their you know their tax base. Um, so from the developer side, the developer has to deal with you know what actually works. So they they need to they back into a return. Um, so in order for them to incentivize the developer to do it, um, they were they they eliminated all the fees that that normally they charge. So there's a permit fee to pull a permit. Um, there's a uh, they had to they take the underground utilities and bring them um, or overground utilities and bring them underground. Um, and so they pay for that for through Lake Electric. There's impact fees. So an impact to schools and police and, you know, what's the charge? So they they got rid of that. So that was around two to three million dollars. Um, they also reduced their real estate taxes for the first five years or everything they could reduce. So when you pay your taxes, I would say probably. 70% of it goes to the city itself. And so they're able to basically defer that. Um, they deferred it as uh, no taxes the first year. The second year, they only paid 80%. The third year, they paid 60, 40, 20. And then after the fifth year, they pay full taxes. And hopefully the rents have you know followed suit with that and helped them get to their return. Uh, the developer had to close on the land, obviously complete the project. And then there's five percent of the units are are uh, are dedicated towards affordable. Um, so total project cost sixty two million dollars. Um, we originated a construction loan with um, HUD. So HUD provides um, it's called a it's, it's a true construction permanent loan. It's it's good for projects like this that have a a long term hold and that you lock your interest rate instead of typically with a bank you would. You would uh, do a bank loan, and then after the bank loan, you would go to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, and so you'd have two different lenders, and so you don't know what your rate is going to be after you finish construction and stabilize. The HUD loan allows you to lock it all in for essentially 42 years, um, so it's two years of construction and then 40 years after that, so it's attractive. Uh, they also give a, attractive financing, and then they put $12 million into it, so we, we closed the HUD loan in 2019. They started construction, you know, shortly after that, uh, December 2019. Uh, they just delivered, I believe, their first units um, a couple months ago, uh, 15 months from the start. The way that works in, in apartment development is, you know, you build your clubhouse out first. So you get your clubhouse delivered. So that's the first thing that goes. And then you're, you want to try and deliver your building by building if possible, um, at least what you're kind of finishing out. And that way you can get some income in. So you get some. You know, so you're not trying to lease up three, four, 305 units at the same time. You're leasing up that building, maybe giving them some discounts because of the construction and so on and so on. Um, and they should be complete, um, I guess, next next month. I'll have to ask them to see where they're at. I think they're I think they're pretty close. You can I think you can go online and look look where they're at. Um, and then they'll ultimately um, lease up the rest of the property. They'll usually do about 20, you know, 20, 15 to 25 units per month. So depending on how big the project is, um, that's where they'll go. And then in this case, they analyze it on a 10-year investment period and their IRR returns, as I'm sure you guys have gone over in class. It's, this is probably the, the most used uh, thing in any type of transaction is the IRR. Um, so for development, you want a higher IRR just because there's a lot more risk involved in that. Um, you also have you know, two to three years with no cash flow because you're building the project. And so, you know, you're trying to get to, you know, uh, you know, a lower teams type of IRR where if you were acquiring the project, you're probably going more for, sorry, uh, lower 20s IRR. And, and if you're acquiring a project, you might be as low as like a 12, 13% IRR. So there, there's a disconnect that goes in there. The other thing you'll look at is um, for people that hold it long term is the cash on cash return. So how much if of your 12 million in equity, what are you getting back per year as, as a return? And then you'll look at those metrics based on kind of what you can invest in the stock and get your dividend returns. Um, and so everyone will kind of look at, at that as an alternative investment. And then they had a very conservative exit. This, all this is based on a 6% cap. Um, today that project would probably sell for a four, four and a half percent cap rate. So 
in reality, that IRR, if, if it was to sell today after 10 years, would probably be closer in the 30% range um, that goes in there. Um, but this this is a pretty good, um, you know, kind of example of what, you know, what I do mostly day to day is um, I'll deal with project like this. I'm probably doing right now, I'm probably doing 10 and they take, they take a long time um, to do and kind of, you know, you got to think you have the, you got the architect, you got the GC, you got the city, you got, you know, everything a developer goes through. I'm, I'm pretty much going through that with them. And then I ultimately have to get it financed. Um, and if they didn't go HUD, you know, we would do the construction loan and then we would roll it into um, either a sale. Um, uh, so our investment sales team would hopefully sell it or we would refinance it with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So, um, you know, from my side, that's, you know, why, why we do that. We can touch local developers um, and what we do. And then, you know, you're kind of generating business maybe a couple of times over when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're going into there. So, um, so that's kind of it. I figured I'd, I'd uh, open it up to, you know, any type of questions or anything anybody has. Is that 6% capitalization rate for that case study project based on the, you know, the average market capitalization rate? And do you do a sensitivity analysis of like 25 to 75 basis points with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, I think what they ended up doing is they, they use what they believe was a cap rate at the time, which was five, I think they used five and a quarter at the time. And then they grew it over time just as a sensitivity. But yeah, typically then when they show it to their investors, they will have a matrix that goes in there. And so they'll have, you know, what the returns will be at four and a half percent and then what the returns would be at, at 6%. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen a 6% cap rate in probably, you know, six or seven years um, on multifamily. So I think, um, you know, that was a project that was so well underwritten for them that they were able to kind of kind of use that that um, that cap rate. The the other thing you will look at is um, besides the RRR, they'll also look at something called an equity multiple. So all that means is how many times you turn in your your money over, you know, in that investment. Um, so those are the two ratios that people will look at from when they're looking at an investment. Thank you. Any question about the project or anything, you know, school related or looking for a job or, you know, what type of industry? Happy to, to chat. Any Can you maybe talk a little bit more about the process of refinancing a construction loan and at what point it goes into the refinancing stage? Yeah, so um, typically they require, well, there's, there's two ways to, there's, there's, it depends on the market. So the, the traditional way is you wait until the project gets the 90% lease. That's pretty much what everyone wants you, considers to be stabilized. And then once it hits 90% lease, then you would, you would refinance it into, you know, a permanent loan. Um, some of the issues that you run up with that is in order to get to 90% refinance, you're usually giving away free rent in order to get it leased up because you're trying to lease up 300 apartments at the same time. And so those are called concessions. And so the lenders will sometimes look at those concessions. And so you're not really maximizing your, your NOI. Um, to go in there, you want some of those concessions to burn off. Um, some people will, when they lease, they'll do concessions to get to 60, 70% lease, then they'll burn all the concessions off because they're proven to the lender that they can get those concessions. What's happening today, and we've, we've probably financed four or five of these uh, last year, is that the, the, the bridge loan, which we talked about before, which is usually the value add portion of it, um, the bridge loan space is so so desperate to get money out. Um, and I'll explain kind of why that is. The, the bridge loan is divided. Typical bridge loan is kind of what Walker and Dunlop would, why we have a bridge loan as well, is that you'll, you'll get a line of credit from your bank up to a certain percentage. So let's say PNC Bank is, I think, our line lender or Bank of America. They'll do, they'll do a line loan to us, which means they're just lending to us on basically on the property up to call it 
50, 60 percent of whatever the capital stack is. We then put our equity into the rest to get to the loan. And if the loan is 80 percent, we're putting the rest of the 20 in. And the, the, the line lender will charge, call it two, two percent, maybe two, two and a quarter. And we'll charge 12. And then say so your overall rate is five. And so that's kind of how the bridge loan space works. What, what happened in, in particularly during COVID and it was starting to happen um, before that is the, the people that were buying real estate and they were acquiring apartments thought that the market was a little bit overheated. And so, you know, when they were looking to buy, you know, maybe a, you know, 1980s vintage apartment complex, the price was getting so high that they said, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be in this space. You know, I, I think it's too risky. I'm not sure if I can get out of this, but they've raised all this capital to buy it or invest in it. And so their, their next space to go is to say, okay, well, I don't want to buy it, which means you're at hundred percent capital stack, but I will lend on it at 80%. So they then get call it a 12% return. They're not getting what they thought they would get. And so that all happened. That was already starting to happen. So the bridge space was starting to get very deep. So there was like, you'll see, you'll probably see it now. If, if you look in there, you'll see different bridge funds are forming. They're all over the place now. Um, and then COVID happened. And now it's really tough to buy, um, even class A assets. So everyone kind of, you know, dove, in, dove into the space. So what's, what's popular now is that the project gets to... 20% least, you know, kind of proves out some type of rents. The bridge fund will, the bridge loan will then come in and refinance the project, but they'll refinance. This wouldn't be a HUD project. This would be a construction loan. They would take out the bank um, and then return capital to the investors because they're, what they're on, they're underwriting based on a stabilized value. So they're, they're underwriting that I'm going to lend in the value add is you're going to lease it up. And I'm going to be I'm going to be able to refinance it back out with Fannie and Freddie, and so for the for the developer it helps them because one they usually go from recourse to non recourse, um, and then you know the second they return capital so they're you know whatever their partner needed, um, you know they're they're in, in effect making making more money, and so that is that's actually a very popular thing that's going on right now it's called a pre lease. And so that allows you to have a little bit more time to burn off the concessions of how you wanted to, you know, get a lease up. And so, um, you know, they'll, they'll come in at, at that period. Um, and then there's the hybrid um, where some life insurance companies and then, or some banks, um, they'll come in at maybe 60, 70% lease. So a little bit less risky for them and they'll do a long-term loan and they will, they'll look at the concessions, but they might take the concessions off earlier. And so that's a way for them to kind of win the business earlier. And they'll price that the same, maybe a little bit more expensive than, um, than what the other one would, than what uh, if it was stabilized. Um, so those are the three different ways to, to, to kind of look at it. And this only happens in, um, in multifamily. Um, you know, it's why I always call multifamily. It's, it's, uh, there's so many people in it is because of how liquid it is. I mean, there's just always a demand for, you know, for this. And then, you know, you're, you're always seeming to be able to get different creative financing techniques to kind of maximize, you know, their returns and their IRRs. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Pino. Um, so when some of these loans transition from recourse to non-recourse, um, what are some of the kind of ways that Walker and Dunlop um, like protects themselves, protects their bottom line? Um, just curious. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's, that's a good question. Um, so a recourse is typically only mostly done on construction, just because there's risk of completion and lease up, and so there's there's an inherent risk that goes in there. Um, so you're you're basically underwriting to you know what you believe the market will. Produce. And so if they're over budget or um, they missed a mark on their rents and sometimes it's hard to, to predict or expenses are higher, um, you know, that's usually the reason that recourse is there. And so that they can go personally, they can go personally back to the developer to, you know, to help right size the loan, you know, for them. Um, from the non-recourse side, um, you know, every, 
we we underwrite. I mean, we did forty one billion dollars, so we're we're pretty good in underwriting. And and you know, uh, it's it's we're basically really just underwriting the property. Um, we obviously want to see that the sponsor has enough liquidity and net worth in case something does happen that they can kind of put the money in. But we're very comfortable at that level that our due diligence and, you know, we service 107 billion that, that we've underwritten it correctly. And if it does go bad, then, you know, obviously that's a messy process. Um, thankfully, you know, part of that's because the economy has been so good for so long. A lot of that's because we're multifamily, the default rates on multifamily are so low um, that we haven't had that, 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 that opportunity, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if you didn't have non-recourse, you know, I think it would be a tougher, you wouldn't have as much transactions because, um, you know, stuff happens, um, you know, obviously with, with, you know, kind of where hotels are at today, I mean, hotels is probably the prime example, you know, those are all non-recourse loans and, you know, the, those lenders, you know, obviously we're, we're not big hotel, we don't have any hotels on our books, thankfully, um, those lenders are going to take a, going to take a huge loss and, and, you know, when, when you're lending, you're trying to lend to say, okay, if I had to own this, at least I'm owning it at this basis. And unfortunately, I think the hotels are going to go below that. And that's the other thing on multifamily. You know, we, we max out at 80%. Um, and so, you know, it, it would have to be a 20% drop in, in where we're underwriting with that. My group. <laughs> I was so good. I don't know. No question. <laughs> There's something that caught my interest early on. Um, was um, you separated the CMBS from some other uh, single loan uh, securitization that you were doing? And how how much of that? It struck me as uh, yeah, that was something I hadn't seen much of so how much of that is happening and kind of maybe talk about a you know a single loan securitization just the basic structure yeah work. it's not a single loan yeah so um so on the you're talking about fannie mae and freddie mac when we when we originate the loan and then we sell it to them so is that what you're referring to yeah so they 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 package it up into a large security um, or at least, at least Freddie Mac does. Um, I'm trying to think Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae, we do sell them off individually because we're, we're the actual seller of that security. Um, so yeah, so Fannie Mae, we originate the loan, then we find the buyer. So we have a trader, so we actually find the buyer for that. Um, and then that gets securitized and that's the buyer for that loan. Uh, Freddie Mac does the same thing that CMBS lenders do. So we, we originate the loan, we put it on our warehouse. We then transfer it, I guess, to Freddie Mac. So we don't securitize it with Freddie Mac. We transfer it to Freddie Mac. They then securitize that into, I think their average pool is a billion dollars. And then so they'll do what's called their K pool. I don't know why they call it K, but their K, K pool, and then they'll securitize that. There is another one that large, some large institutions, we, we've done a couple of them, is a single borrower securitization. So, um, you know, uh, Kane Anderson did one. Um, uh, the Graystar, Graystar did one where you just take all the loans. Your, your loans are so big, you can securitize your whole portfolio into one. And um, you're, you're cutting out a lot of the, I mean, you're, it's priced a lot better. Uh, the execution is a lot better. And then for the, um, for the person that's, uh, for, the, for the borrower that's doing it or the, the owner that's doing it, they're able to rotate properties in and out of that, that facility um, that goes in there. That's helpful. Just, yeah, I mean, one thing I've always, I've, I've always told owners, like, you know, when they come to me and they're trying to, you know, especially in more and multifamily, when they're trying to figure out creative ways to maximize and make more money, and when they, when they, when the way is to make the multifamily more complicated, which is either to, you know hey, we'll just condo out a portion and we can get max leverage over here. I always have to remind them that you're going to get dinged on, you're probably not going to be eligible for Fannie, Freddie, and HUD for the most part. 
And then the buyer is going to see that as too complicated as well. So uh, multifamily is one of those where you just kind of just, it's, it's, it's underwritten and it's, it's just tried and true. And you just try and keep it, just try and not get it get too complicated um, just because it's so liquid. Dr. Archer, if you have a question, yeah. you're muted. Yeah, I, I just realized. Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy, I, I just asked, do you see any big changes in the uh, the way uh, your business operates in the in the months and years ahead? Or are you pretty stable as it is? Um, I mean, I think the business itself is pretty stable. Um, I, I do think that there are some technology changes that are that are coming up um, in our business. Um, I mean, I love, I love appraisers. Appraisers are good, but you know, we can press a button and probably have just as much information as an appraiser, if not a multifamily at least in our servicing portfolio um, that goes in there. So I think, I think from an industry standpoint, I think you might see more, you know, tech changes that go in there to make things faster and, and more fluid. Um, but as far as from a, from the investing side, from the lending side, and how everything operates, you know, the consolidation of firms has already happened. Um, you know, the only major, major change that would ever, I think, happen to our industry is if Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and and HUD, um, you know, take a different form. Um, that that could dramatically affect um, kind of the market. Um, but I don't, I don't see that happening. You know, I mean, it's, it's always been, been talked about for probably 15 years. Um, you know, one, one way they could do it, and I'll just explain how HUD and Fannie and Freddie are, are different. Um, HUD charges what's called a, a mortgage insurance premium. Um, and so they, they don't actually do the loan. It just, gets, it just gets securitized. So instead of guaranteeing it, they charge 25 basis points or 50 basis points, whatever the loan calls for. Um, to go in there. Right now, HUD's cheaper, but sometimes if that market's not fluid, HUD can be more expensive. If, if Fannie and Freddie, they just securitize the entire loan and just have the, the implicit um, government guarantee, that's been a lot of what um, has been going on in Congress is saying, should, should the federal government be guaranteeing these loans? And that reverts all the way back to the financial crisis of you know, 2007, a lot of single family, not multifamily. And so that's when you hear the debate, that is usually the debate that has legislation that's always gone on. Um, I think that's that at one time was probably number three in the queue. It's probably number 15 in the queue now. <laughs> but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. But, um, you know, because 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 it is so liquid and that pricing is there, if there is a change in how that works and it's not as efficient, then the rates go up and the cap rates go up. And then, you know, it just cycles all the way down the line. But um you know, other, other than the normal real estate changes that we've seen, you know, retail, you know, obviously kind of winding down to the best sites and industrial ramping up. And, um, you know, I don't, I, from the lending side, I don't see, I don't see that many changes. Thank you. Well, at the yeah, height of the financial crisis, I think, uh, I think Freddie and Fannie borrowed about 160, 170 billion from the federal government. They obviously have Paid that back, and they're, um, you know, given that they're generating profits as as, as uh, federal entities, there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of initiative in Congress, right, to spin them off into some form or some of the business in some form of a private entity because um, you know they're generating profits for the for the treasury. Um, so there's uh, that's why that's why they've been in conservatorship now for 13 years. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, it seems seems to be working. Um, and there definitely was, there definitely is a change. I mean, anybody who's trying to get a house knows how difficult it is. You know, most of those loans are sold to Fannie and Freddie. And so it's, they're highly scrutinized now. And so I think they've, you know, while some people think that they're aggressive, I don't think they're that aggressive right now. And maybe, maybe could get a little bit more aggressive, um, but they decided not to. And then from the multifamily side, you know, um, they obviously took big hits just because it was, they were, they were, they were getting creative in their financing. 
Um, but they won, they, a lot of them, they refinanced out of their own portfolio. So they really didn't have that many defaults, even during the recession on the, on the multifamily side. Um, and, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac took two different routes. Fannie Mae um, sold off their REO to NJVs, to, to people that acquired real estate. And so they would give a discount and split the profits of whatever they, they wanted someone else to manage it. So they, they kind of offloaded all their all their losses onto them, and, and just took the losses up front. Freddie Mac stayed solid and um, didn't do you know a lot of that. I think if Fannie Mae looked back, they probably they probably would have held on and and seen that you know they they were able to refinance and then all the values went up you know relatively quickly. Um, so it's um, you know, I, I think when they'll do it different, but it, I think where everything is underwritten today, it's nothing is getting aggressive um, from our side that we see. Um, you know, especially for, especially from that side, and I think I think they've been very um, very cognizant of that. Any final questions from our students? Well, this is a great picture. You've you you uh, you've uh, uh, certainly uh, brought us up to date in a number of ways, I think, and uh, appreciate it very much. Always yeah, good thanks, to thanks. see what you're up to. Uh, we're, you, you make us proud. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, thank you for having me. And, you know, I guess I'm officially old now, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Great to see you. Thank yeah, you very thanks. much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Archer? Yes, sir. I just wanted to make sure I got this uh, quote right from him because I want to use it before I <clears throat> meet with this appraiser next week. So in the multifamily asset type, uh, underwriting technology has advanced and there is less of a need or less of a dependency on appraisers. Is that what he, did he hint at that? Dr. Yeah, Ling, do you that, agree with that? That's a continuing uh, uh, migration, so to speak. It started with in the single family with automated uh, uh, underwriting and automated uh, uh, appraisal. And uh, there, there's uh, Fannie and uh, Freddie Mac has estimated, uh, I think probably correctly, that they can probably uh, estimate the value uh, of 80% uh, of the stock that they're dealing with and refinancing electronically, mm -hmm. at least as accurately as the local appraisers have done it at uh, times in the past. There's some reasons why, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have a massive database uh, and uh, they're constantly refining their models. And uh, so they, they sort of have a better first shot uh, than, uh, than for, for, for ordinary standard stuff. Now there's a 20% where they really can't do it very well. And uh, the, uh, they used to at least last I knew 20% they say, where they really have to rely on, on good appraisers. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so what I hear him saying is this has crept over into the multifamily as well. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to continue, right? I mean, appraisers are paid to collect relevant data, interpret that data and make value assessments. And, and, um, for many years, I would say appraisers sort of had an advantage with respect to, to data, right? They had their own file of appraisers. They had local contacts. But, you know, with, with the way data is being, you know, uh, just the way things have gone more online, there's more digital, uh, there's, uh, there's, there, there's even the uh, you know, machine learning piece of it that uh, I don't fully understand. Some of our academic colleagues are into machine learning research, you know, the where where these algorithms are being fed, you know, not just square footage and age of the property, but you know, pictures of the property, and those pictures can can be used to actually generate <clears throat> or help generate opinions of value. So, you no, know, I think that uh, I think technology, and of course, prop tech is something that a lot of folks are talking about, right? There's seminars and conferences on prop tech broadly defined all the time. So I think it's pretty exciting. And I do think, I do think appraisers are one, one group of folks that um, 
you have to be concerned. Are they potentially going the way of the travel agent? Well, you know, that's, I'd have to think about that analogy, Phil, but that might be, you know, what exactly do travel agents do now? I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess. I guess. There, there probably are, and I, I suspect if we look too closely at travel agents, again, that maybe 80% of their ordinary bread and butter work has been taken away by the, the web, but there are still certain kinds of things, uh, uh, organizing groups, uh, 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 sort of marketing, getting people motivated to become involved in travel, this sort of thing. They may still be doing that and playing an important role mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, putting together successful uh, uh, <clears throat> travel programs. And I guess in, in my analogy would be that uh, there are appraisers that uh, you know, there's some kinds of work, more complex kinds of work and uncertain valuations where a, a lot of judgment is still involved. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's those that's where the appraiser uh, still has uh, work that they can do, particularly in value added situations and the workout situations uh, where the where the deal is complex. So so I, I, I don't see them disappearing but I see the kind of work they do getting more and more challenging, and there probably are a few of them, fewer of them. Yeah, especially, yeah, the, the just continued pressure on fees, right? I mean, it's got to be. Hey, so did we? Did Sammy verify whether or not he had access to CoStar? I didn't quite catch what he said. I believe he said both of them are are working. Doctor Arch, I'm going to stop the recording unless you have any. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, so does that mean you 